Was there really a worldwide flood as described in the book of Genesis? If so, what kind of scientific evidence do we have for this? Why is this story such a downplayed event? Discover a much better big picture understanding of the relevance and reality of this worldwide catastrophe. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, The Genesis Flood Part 1 with Jay Siegert. Hello and welcome to Origins. I'm Ray Heipel. It's an honor to be your host today. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science along with other important facts validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Today's guest, Jay Siegert, is an author and international speaker and holds degrees in both physics and engineering technology. He currently serves as the managing director of the Starting Point Project, which defends the Christian worldview. And he is also the president of Logos Research Associates. Jay has been speaking on the authority of scripture for over 38 years. Jay, welcome back to the program. It's great to be here again. Well, we're gonna be talking about one of my favorite subjects, the Genesis flood or the flood of Noah. So how are we gonna start this program? Well, we're gonna cover a few things in two parts. Part number one, we're gonna look at the significance of this event. We'll look at whether it was local or global and then very briefly we'll look at the power of moving water. Part two we'll get into the specific evidences but if, if we don't understand the significance of this event the details of the scientific evidence become trivial so that's what we're going to hit first and foremost. When I give this presentation I also subtitle it This Changes Everything. The Genesis Flood, This Changes Everything. Sounds kind of sensational but it's really true if we truly understand this event, it changes most of what we've been taught through especially public school systems about the history of the earth and about history in general. We're not going to be focusing on creation and evolution in this particular talk, but it does affect that drastically. When you picture the geologic column and all the layers there and the names they've given them and ages, and then you have the succession of fossils there, we are typically taught that's proof of evolution, single-celled organism 3.8 billion years ago, slowly evolved into every other life form on this planet over hundreds and hundreds of millions of years. Well, if these layers were not laid down slowly over hundreds of millions of years, but they were deposited catastrophically in the Genesis flood, that destroys the foundation for the whole idea of evolution. It just absolutely could not have occurred. So secular geologists are not even going to give consideration whatsoever to a global flood. And it seems like uh, we can understand that. I mean, everything that they're saying, all that time that they need and the layers, if the flood did it in a year, basically, right? Then, then we get rid of the three billion years or whatever, and uh, suddenly people aren't going to be trusting them very much anymore, I wouldn't think. Absolutely, they cannot give up that time frame. And we're also gonna tie this into prophecy. This is pretty interesting. In Second Peter chapter three, Peter is writing uh, almost 2,000 years ago, and Peter is specifically talking about the end times, the last days. And most of us probably feel that we're living in those days. And Peter is specifically referencing the skeptics of our day who are doubting the return of Christ. So that's the context for this passage. And Peter says that these skeptics, they deliberately overlook, King James says they are willingly ignorant of two major things. Now you would expect those things to probably be something spiritual if they're doubting the return of Christ. That's not what Peter says. Peter says number one, they're rejecting the Genesis creation account and number two, they're rejecting the Genesis flood. Now, that might be a little bit confusing, like what does that have to do with people doubting the return of Christ? Well, by rejecting the Genesis creation account, they're rejecting God as the ultimate authority of everything. He created everything, he sets the rules, people don't want to be under his authority by rejecting the Genesis flood, what was that? That was God's judgment on sin. Most people don't see themselves as these sinners who need judgment, they reject that. Because of that, they're gonna reject the return of Christ because that represents a second judgment by God. 
This time it's going to be by fire. That's why the skeptics of our day who are doubting the return of Christ are doing so because they're rejecting the Genesis creation account and the Genesis flood. How significant that the scripture shows that very point on which unfortunately many Christians are willing to compromise and think maybe it's not really that much of a compromise. Well, we don't have to worry about whether or not God created the world and whether or not Noah's flood was a global flood or if it ever happened. We just have to tell people about Jesus. And Peter's basically saying if you lose creation and you lose the flood, they're not going to hear the message about Jesus. Yes, and even today, not only secular scientists reject creation of the flood, many Christians reject creation of the flood. Oh, God's the creator, but he didn't create it the way Genesis says, and there wasn't really a flood because they, secular scientists don't believe in it, so we can't believe in that either. So that takes us back to the Garden of Eden, and something that was very important, Satan came into that garden and started messing with Eve and said, did God really say... Did God really say you can't eat of any tree in that garden? Well, God didn't say that. He said you can eat of any tree in that garden except for one. So Satan misquoted God, twisted his words, took it out of context, and got Eve to doubt the authority of God's word. His plan hasn't changed at all today. He's getting people today to doubt God's word, even many Christians, unfortunately. And today, we've pretty much lost our moral compass. Things have always been getting worse slowly over time, but... Pretty much the wheels have fallen off and everything has gone upside down. And Jesus talked about the last days. He said, for as it were in the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. He said when he himself is going to return, it's going to be like it was in the day of Noah. Well, what do we know about the days of Noah? The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man from whom I have created from the face of the land. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Things had gotten so bad that God said, that's it. I'm going to judge this planet. I'm going to wipe him out. But he spared Noah and his family and two of each kind of animal. Well, today, things have gone upside down. We're dealing with so many issues. It's not that any one of these is too hard. It's they're overwhelming the system. It's like the guy on the stage trying to keep all the plates spinning. We're running around trying to deal with all these things when we should really be focusing on our starting point that would give us an authority to respond to each of these issues. So very quickly, we're going to talk about how did this happen, this leading into rejecting of the Genesis flood. Quick history lesson for us. Many people come down pretty hard on Darwin. They, they say, oh, he invented the idea of evolution and changed everything. No, he didn't invent it. He just popularized it. It had been around for a while. But he didn't do that in a vacuum. He didn't wake up one day planning to play tennis, but it was raining, and so he said, oh, I guess I'll write the origin of species. <laughs> Things were going on prior to that. We'll start out with James Hutton. James Hutton is considered the father of modern geology, and this is what he said. The past history of our globe must be explained by what can be seen to be happening now. No powers are to be employed that are not natural to the globe, no action to be admitted except those of which we know the principle. This became known as something we call uniformitarianism. When you try to explain the physical features of the, of the earth, you can only refer to things we see happening today. Wind and rain and a little bit of erosion, nothing supernatural, nothing catastrophic. This was a philosophical decision to do that. It wasn't a scientific conclusion. The year Hutton died, Charles Lyell was born. He was a lawyer then later became a geologist. He piggybacked on Hutton's work, and he wrote a three-volume series of Principles of Geology. And he admitted his goal in writing these three books was to free the science from Moses. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, Moses talked all about creation and the flood. He said, we need to get away from that in science and just look at these natural principles happening over millions and millions of years. You know what's interesting about that, uh, Jay, is that He's admitting that at least until the middle of the 19th century or so, science uh, did affirm Genesis, did affirm Moses, did affirm the flood, did affirm creation, and his job was to move it away. So, that, you know, not that long ago, science was saying, yeah, there was a God, there was a flood, and, and it sounds like, uh, at least from what we see, that he was pretty successful in reaching his goal so far. Right. Yeah, science was birthed out of the Christian community. It owes its origins to Christianity. But even Jesus referenced this. He said, for if you believed Moses, meaning the whole creation flood account too, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. 
But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Jesus is saying, why are you going to listen to what I have to say if you're rejecting what Moses said? Because Moses even talked about me. And so what happened was Charles Darwin took the first of these three books with him on the Beagle, on his famous voyage. And he concluded if these two guys could explain the physical features of the earth by natural processes operating over these newly discovered millions and millions of years, he, Darwin, maybe could explain the variety of living things by natural processes over millions and millions of years. So he writes The Origin of Species. Mm -hmm. And that's the backdrop of what's happened in history. Even today, it's, I think, gotten in within the Christian society. This is from February 2021. Noah and the flood. They talk about the story. Now, the word story isn't the worst word, but sometimes it makes it seem a little tainted, like it didn't actually happen. But it's not terrible to use this word story when you're talking about the flood. It's common. But further down, they say, even if it didn't happen, it's a true story. Well, like, that's a okay. pretty nonsensical statement just on the face of it. <laughs> Very confusing. Like, okay, and then I scroll down further, and then they say the Genesis tale. Mm. Now they've really watered it down. It's not an account. It's, it's actually a tale. And then they end with this. Although the great flood may not have happened exactly as Genesis relates it, it doesn't mean it's not a true story in some sense. Like, in what sense if it didn't actually happen? Yeah, it really waters things down mm. and we lose our foundation. Uh, William Lane Craig, great Christian apologist, very powerful debater against atheists. I am not referencing him to disparage him in any way. I'm just drawing attention that even many Christian leaders, in my mind, have compromised their view on Scripture based on what they hear from secular sources. So this is his comment about Noah's flood. Take, for example, the attempt to explain away the earth's sedimentation on the basis of so-called flood geology. Noah's flood. The idea that there ever was a worldwide flood that destroyed all terrestrial life on earth and laid down the earth's sediments is a fantasy. Wow. I was really sad when I read that because I respect him in many ways of his approach to defending Christianity, but I think here's an example where I, I believe that he's compromising his view on scripture based on what he believes about secular geology. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, and certainly with this topic, so very quickly, we're going to look at a biblical description of the flood. And with the time we have, we're just going to look at the highlighted words. What does the Bible say about the flood? Genesis 6, 17, it talks about destroying all flesh. Everything that is under shall die. The great, all the great fountains of the deep were broken up. The ark rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth. The waters prevailed all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them about 15 cubits deep, which is maybe 22 and a half feet. All flesh died uh, on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures, and all mankind, everything on dry land, everything that lives on the face of the earth and on the ground was blotted out. Only Noah and those who were with him on the ark, and two of each kind of animals, and the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. Point is, is the Bible describing a local flood <laughs> or is it actually a global flood? Well, seven quick problems with the idea that the flood in the Bible is just, just a local flood. Number one, if it was just a local flood, why would Noah spend so many years building an ark? If you do the study, it's maybe up to 75 years he would have spent. God could have said, hey, Noah, here's a number of a good realtor, move. <laughs> Just move, I'm yeah. going to flood this area. But he spent all that time building an ark. Number two, why such a massive ark? Maybe up to two million cubic feet of storage space. If it was a local flood, you could just build a little boat to put enough of the local animals on it. Global flood, you'd need something big enough for two of each kind. Number three, why put birds on the ark? Local flood, they could have just flown away. They'd been fine. Global flood for a year, yeah, you'd need birds on the ark. Number four, it says all the high hills under the whole heaven. It's, it's an imperative in the Hebrew there. Every hill on the whole planet was covered. You can't cover all the high hills under the whole heavens in a local area. Water seeks its own level, so this makes no sense unless it was actually a global flood. Number five, did God break his promise? We have the rainbow today. What is a rainbow symbol of? Well, Genesis 9, it's God's covenant with Noah. 
neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, when you see the rainbow, that's going to be a reminder, I'm not doing this again. If it was just a local flood to begin with, then apparently God lied because we've had thousands of floods where hundreds of thousands of people have lost their lives. And they're, they're pretty massive local floods. I've watched videos, I'm sure you have on YouTube, where you know entire cities are swept away, coastlines swept away. And I, I don't know how you could say that God, like you said, kept his promise. He obviously didn't. Maybe that part's fantasy too. Yeah, doesn't make any sense. And then number six, local floods don't last 370 days, but the biblical flood lasted just over a year, about 370 days. And lastly, uh, the waters receded for 73 days. It doesn't take that long for local floods to recede. These are all very powerful biblical reasons to know that God is talking about a global flood that actually happened. And there's a lot of physical evidence for it. Part two, we'll get into some of that. In one of my other talks, I go through eight major evidences. We'll be covering about five of those in part two. Okay, Jay, I'll have to stop you right there. We'll be right back with more of the Genesis Flood. Stay with us. We hope you're enjoying Origins TV. It all started at Cornerstone Television in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We've been producing new episodes for over 37 years now. We praise God for the success of the program and are excited to introduce you to Origins and to us. If you're interested in watching more episodes of Origins, you can find them on our YouTube page. Simply go to YouTube and search Cornerstone Television Network. Click the like and subscribe buttons, then you'll find the best episodes of Origins in our playlist. You can also visit our website at ctvn.org slash origins. One more way you can stay connected with us is to subscribe to our free monthly Hope Today newsletter, which you can do from our website. And if you have any questions, call us here at Cornerstone Television at 888-665-4483. We'd love to connect with you. Thank you for watching. Welcome back to Origins. We're talking to Jay Siegert, who's been sharing about the Genesis Flood, Part 1. Jay, you just got done showing us seven problems with a local flood. And we read the scripture account, and you had it on the screen. It seems very clear that it was a global flood. And yet, as you showed, so many professing Christians try to somehow get from that text a local flood. They, they have all this, I don't know, uh, desire to prove or to try to show or satisfy the Bible with a local flood. Why this effort? Why, why do they do it when there's all these problems and the Bible is just so plain? I mean, what, what do you think is, is the reason for this? Well, they consciously or subconsciously first go to other sources for truth, uh, academic society, geology, astronomy, whatever it is, and they, they just accept that as true, and then they go into God's Word to try to figure out, well, what does it really mean, knowing what I know now, which is kind of backwards. We should really start with God's Word and use that to better understand the conclusions of some of the secular geologists and astronomers, and they want to please man more than God, which Scripture warns us about. So they, they don't want to just take Scripture for what it says because they, they would lose the, the approval of the academic society. Mm. So it's really a try, an attempt to hold on to a, a view that says the Bible isn't true, and yet at the same time try to affirm in some sense a truth from the Bible that will somehow at least satisfy some of these folks over here. Yeah, but it's hard to be consistent oh. that way. So, yeah. And in part two, we'll be looking at the evidences that there really was a worldwide flood but before we get there, we're going to finish up this part looking at the power of moving water. Okay. Uh, even a small amount of water can do a lot of damage. I'm just going to bring up two quick examples. One has to do with a trip to Fiji, the other one a place called Burlingame Canyon. Um, you've had Bruce Malone on programs before. He and I are friends. He got his foot in the door down in Fiji to actually speak in public schools in Fiji. Uh, sharing the Genesis creation account, evidence for creation, God the Creator, even in many cases, Jesus Christ himself. 
So it was a great opportunity. He was asked to reach all the schools. He couldn't do that on his own. Wow. So he asked if I would help. So I went down there with my wife once and went down a second time with him. So this is just one of the episodes that we had while we were down there. Suffering for the Lord in Fiji. Well, we were, in the, <laughs> we were not laying around on the beaches. We were in <laughs> okay, the okay. deep interior. Uh, take hours to get there, banging around in okay. army trucks. And uh, we were at the public schools talking to the students there, which was very exciting. But uh, we had to cross a lot of bridges along the way. There's only one major road into the deep interior. And one day when we were speaking, it started raining a lot during our sessions. And afterwards, we're driving back. So I'm in the back of an army truck, and then there's an SUV following us. And again, we crossed a lot of bridges. And here's a specific bridge that we had to come across to get to the school. And then afterwards, we had to turn on go across the bridge again to get back because there's only one road. Well, on the way out, this was the bridge afterwards. Wow. Uh, it was no longer a bridge. You'll be able to see the road that we were trying to get to. Um, we watched oh, yeah. this for about three hours. Okay. And after a few minutes, I told the other people, I said, hey, look at the way the water's swirling. I don't think the bridge is there anymore. So we took a big stick, put it down in the water, went all the way down. Bridge was gone. So even if the water subsided, we weren't getting across. Mm -hmm. And so the only thing we could do is turn around, drive the wrong way in the road, go all the way to the other side of the island, drove all night long, went to the next school, and started speaking with no sleep at night. So it was kind of a rough trip, but I felt God made up for it the next day. When I was talking with Bruce, I looked over his shoulder and I saw the sunset. This is what I saw. I took this picture with my phone. It looks so beautiful, it looks fake. And when I look at the picture now, I thought, I could, I could picture dinosaur being yeah, there. Yeah, so really. Picture's real, the dinosaur isn't, but uh, it kind of made up for some of the challenges we had. But the point is, that was just a little bit of water from some rain in a few hours washed out that bridge. So the second example I have here is something called Burlingame Canyon up in the state of Washington. Um, some engineers needed to temporarily reroute some water for farmers, and they put it into this drainage ditch. It's about six feet wide, up to 10 feet deep in some portions. So they did that, and this is what that drainage ditch turned into. Oh, wow. 1,500 feet long, 120 feet deep, and 120 feet wide. So can you imagine, just six years later, you see this. Well, it wasn't six years later. It was six days Six later. days? So now today... But all those layers, I know. each one's millions of years, yeah, right? Yeah, you I carve mean. that out. You would think that would take, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of years to carve. No, six days of a little bit of water that was rerouted. So again, if something like this can happen in a short period of time, imagine what can happen over a longer period of time. So looking at canyons, we got to bring up briefly Mount St. Helens. I think you've done shows on that, so we're not going to go into a lot of details, just something that's related to what we're talking about today. In 1982, in a sense, there was a burp in the cone, and a mud flow came out, and it carved a 140th scale Grand Canyon in Solid Rock in one day. This is actually now the Grand Canyon that we're looking at. And if we go back to Mount St. Helens, this is uh, a series of canyons carved out by the mud flow in one day. You could apply that to the Grand Canyon and very easily see how that whole thing could have been carved out catastrophically in a very short period of time, especially if you're talking about an amount of water that was covering the entire continent. Uh, Jay, when you go around and you speak on this, do you find that a lot of opposition or, or what do you do uh, when you have someone who just says, well, that's not what the science says? Right, and it's all about the narrative driving that. They're only letting one narrative be taught in the school system. So everything in the past that we didn't see, they're just gonna assume it took natural processes long periods of time, even though we can see today supernatural and catastrophic processes happening in a very short period of time. It's really interesting because years ago, I've been, I've been speaking for over 37, 38 years, um, I got a lot of pushback from skeptics and atheists, and at some point I felt God leading me to focus a little bit more on the church and help strengthen the faith of the Christian. I almost got more pushback within the church yeah. because people are animated thinking, well, no, you can't take scripture that way because of what they think they've learned from the public school system, documentaries, whatever it is. So they always take those supposed truths, use it as a lens to look at God's word and decide what they're going to believe and what they're not. Well, why magically believe the Jesus stuff mm -hmm. if you're going to throw out the Genesis creation account and the flood, which are foundational for all the doctrines we believe? And again, I asked one guy, you know, science has certainly shown us that people don't come back from the dead. So when it says that Jesus rose again after three days, you, you can't really believe that anymore either because we know better now. And he got very upset about that, thought I was being sarcastic. And I said, no, I'm not being sarcastic. I'm using your logic. 
looking at what science teaches us, using that to understand scripture. That's where he said, yeah, but that was a miracle. And I said, I believe that it was a miracle. And just like Jesus could rise again after three days, he could create everything in six days, just like you said. Mm. You know, the, the sad thing for uh, me is that the Christians who, who do this, who would criticize what we're doing here today, saying, you know, that we're wrong, and they're actually thinking that they're making the Bible more palatable. They're making the faith, you know, more presentable to unbelievers. Uh, maybe uh, people will be more open to the gospel if we can just show them how well the Bible is scientific, and here's how the flood works with modern science. And I think what they're missing is they're throwing out the gospel. They don't realize it. Like we looked at with those scriptures again, when you deny creation and you deny the flood, you by definition deny supernatural. And if you deny supernatural, boy, there's no virgin birth. There's no walking on water. You know, like you said, there's no resurrection. There's no ascension into heaven. And he's certainly not coming back to judge the living and the dead. And I think, unfortunately, the unbeliever makes those connections, even though the believer thinks that they can separate them. And, uh, unfortunately, it does affect the gospel. Well, Jay, I, I'm sorry we're out of time, but uh, I can't wait until you come back and we can do part two. It'll be a great show. Thanks for being on the program. You know, the Bible speaks of a flood that covered all of the dry land on the whole planet. That changed and shaped the whole surface of the earth. Because of the pressure of modern scientific theories, many professing Christians deny that flood occurred. They mistakenly think they can reject the supernatural creation and global flood and still have the salvation of Jesus. But their compromise has resulted in an unprecedented age of skepticism and unbelief, just like the Bible said it would. Just goes to show you, beloved, we know what the Bible says is true and the proof, it's all around you. If you enjoy Origins, we could, we could sure use your help to keep this Creation TV program on the air. Your financial support, your prayerful support make a big difference. Let's work together to reveal how awesome our Creator really is, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. For a DVD of this series, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program Number 2403, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. This presentation was made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.